Okay, everybody, it looks like I'm back on. I'm not sure if you can see me or not. It looks like I'm not really properly lit. Um, sorry. Um, let's see. Yeah, well, that's kind of the lighting we're going to have here, unless I can flip this one on over here, which I possibly will do in a minute. So today I'm doing a little bit of a change-up, and I'm talking to you about my experience as a student of ufology and um, how that intersects with my status as a minister uh, and a chaplain in a New Age church. I'm a military chaplain um, in the process of trying to achieve billeting. So my effort is to take my chaplaincy work to the right base component of uh, the joint forces and to continue with work from there. I also have training with regard to voter registration. There's a program called UOCAVA, which is uniformed, let's see here, uniformed overseas citizen, uniformed, uniformed in overseas citizens, listen to this, uniformed in overseas citizens, UO uh, uh, Absentee Voting Act, that's what it is, uniform, uniformed in overseas citizens, absentee voting act, and I'm trained with UOCAVA standards, which means that Towns and military bases have to furnish offices that provide a process so that people can vote. Um, so people overseas need to be sent ballots and they need to be able to vote, including deployed military. So I'm constantly trying to get someone to assist with that, um, establishing, setting me up for that. Um, so talking to you a little bit, following up uh, with Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar is a UFO witness and someone who, he's an engineer um, and uh, worked on projects that exposed him to extraterrestrial craft um, in Area 51, which is a part of Nevada. That's a top secret U.S. military range. It's a testing range for very horrible weapons like chemical weapons and so forth. I don't know if they do nuclear there or not. Um, and it's also a base that's basically operated in conjunction with the major uh, space contractors and airplane contractors like Boeing, Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin is actually written all over what goes on down there. Um, and these are disclosures that were made publicly by Bob Lazar. And I read a number of abduction survivor stories and people who are witnessing flying saucers and I've been doing this for years um, and I've kind of been because I was sidetracked in my career uh, pending the outcome of uh, litigation including litigation that ties to the military for anybody who wants to pitch in with that um, I took a, a, a side trip away from concerns about that whether or not you believe quote-unquote in flying saucers and I'm flexible I don't think everybody has to think in those terms I think, but I think some people want to think in terms of, gee, what it, of, of the potential, including potential dangers, and, and how, we, how we deal with them. Let me just recount for you the UFO information as it emerges from Nevada. And um, I will dovetail that with information about my own experience confronting and discussing uh, foreign craft. <laughs> um, so, right, so there's a range. And it's an actual place, and like Bob says, it's, people don't dispute that it exists. You can drive up to it, and you can see it on the on the internet. You, it's out in the middle of nowhere, and they have it cordoned off, so it's not fenced, but there are posts. It's posted, and I think it's every hundred feet it's posted. And if you go like twenty feet over this one border, if you cross the border, you'll be intercepted immediately. I mean, if you walk into the space, they'll know because it's all surveyed, um, or there's surveillance rather, um, and it's surveyed, but Right, so if you don't believe in the UFO component of it, fine, but the reality is that it's, it's a secret base. It's a secret governmental base. You're not allowed there. Most people aren't allowed to, to talk about what goes on there, and I did some digging. One of the things that Bob Lazar says, and I've seen other sources for this too, is that there's a secret flight out of, I want to say North Vegas. It, it's north of Vegas, and I think it's a little bit north of I think it's a little bit north of Las Vegas. It's 80 miles, miles out of... Actually, the area itself is begins about 80 miles outside of 
Las Vegas, so you could drive to it. But you could also fly to it, but there's a flight in the morning that workers take that's entirely top secret. It's not even, they don't even, it's, it's privately operated between the conglomerate, cabal, whatever you want to call it, U.S. military operation, um, interacting with places like the corporations, as I said, it's really lo largely run by Lockheed Martin, um, and uh, the other, other aircraft manufacturers. So you don't want to believe that it's UFOs that they're handling out there. That's fine. But the legend is that after the Roswell crash, you might have heard of the famous Roswell crash that they recovered as flying saucer in 1947. After that, according to legend, those the, 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 the wreckage, some say bodies, unfortunately. I know a couple of people who don't think that those uh, extraterrestrials died, but everything ended up down at that range. Area 51. There are different parts of Area 51. Those in the know know about S4, and S4 is really where you don't want to talk too much about it without getting into trouble with the government, it says. I have been doing this for such a long time that I think the government will probably try to nail me for something else. But, um, right, there's S4, which is even more secret than Area 51, and also something called Groom Lake. And Groom Lake is a completely dry lake. It's an old lake bed. But there are facilities and ranges down there as well, hangars and so forth, I, I, I believe. I'll have to double check, you know, I don't have a good handle on the entire blueprint of, of the place. But so, right, Bob Lazar, lots of information on the internet about his experience going down there, working on things. And then one day, apparently he has the clearance for it. He goes and he showed a uh, down flying saucer or a retrieved flying saucer or one they're trying to retrofit which they're, they're trying to retrofit a design you'll have to listen to his accounting to get all of the details but he actually said he actually entered the thing not a very big craft because the the beings who operated it he said you could see where everything was sort of small it was sort of miniaturized um, but he was able to stick his head down and look around and um and so forth, and he, I think he, and he, I know that he witnessed actual, either, I think it was probably the testing of a revamped foreign craft, that's his allegation, you'll have to look at that too, um, but yeah, um, so, strange place, interesting place, place of lore, but also a place to think about in terms of the integrity of the military, you want to make sure that stories are not crushed when people experience loss at places like these. You want to make sure that survivors are remembered, that people take are taken seriously when they come up with claims in a context that others find alarming, but that still must be addressed. Ultimately, you have to have compassion and develop compassion for all um, narratives coming out of people who are God directed and haven't done anything wrong. So um, these people who are light bearers are making these claims and, and telling these stories. And there's a second gentleman who went down to, uh, Bob Lazar is very well known, and I studied him a bit when I did my thesis. My thesis centered basically around the formation of um, the CIA, which used to be known as, it used to be called the ISS, back in the day when um, Julia Child, the famous <laughs> um, French chef, uh, was in the ISS. Um, and um, But hers was the precursor to the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. No, very few people know that that she actually worked at that place. <laughs> it's interesting. Ina Garden used to be in, uh, work for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission directly in Washington, DC. So these people have departmental, my friends, quote unquote, online, including my chef friends apparently have those sorts of ties, which is interesting. But my thesis was based on Area 51. Yes, to an, well, actually it didn't focus on Area 51 as much as it focused on the actual recovery of the Roswell craft, which I can talk to you about in depth um, because I've studied it for such a long, for years, as I, as I stated. i um, trying to think, and then there's the other gentleman, uh, uh, before I get to uh, the crash and the recovery, what I'll tell you about is the other gentleman who went down um, there, who actually interacted with one of the foreign engines, and he was 17 years old at the time, and he was a, a, a whiz kid, and um, 
had all these special skills and somehow he was recruited for I think it was an internship I don't remember and it could have been an early phase of the military I don't know but 17 year old, years old at the time when he went down to this place and he said he saw it there in one of the hangars and it was a recovered um, engine that was a f extraterrestrial engine they didn't know how it worked and I will look at the science and the math and try to interpret it to the to the extent that I could um, uh, approach that sort of information safely. But um, but he saw and inter interacted with one of those in his capacity as a young um, engineer, and said that it was not from this planet. That when you touched it, when you looked at it, it kind of had like swirling rainbow. Um, uh, patterns on it and the metal was un unknown and um, when he put his hand on it he said it 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 was odd because the metal became your skin temperature instantaneously so it could have been cold it could have been hot there was no hot and cold to the you know how your car heats up you don't want to touch your car or it's cold you touch your car and it's like touching the side of an orange juice frozen orange juice uh, can um, you when he said that's one of the features that it had is that the metal re responded to the touch of human skin and that um, by way of the, the temperature increase and he will talk to you in depth about the difference between what uh, that engine and how it operated and what's possible to develop on the, on the planet now exterior to ET influence um, in detailed engineering language which I can share with you a bit so that's not Bob Lazar, but a second gentleman. I need to credit him. And I want to look him up right now because I want to make sure that I'm referring to the right people. Um, and I'll talk to you about Travis Walton if you want to hear more about that story too. Let's go, please. If I can get people's files up, I can actually distribute information. Looks like it's not wanting to pull up stuff on my computer, which is not a shocker. I'll tell you about, I'll, I'll get you the gentleman's name. But then the um, the other features to know about um, about Area 51 and Roswell. Roswell, when that happened, the government released a report that said immediately, and you can look it up in the papers and find it in the papers. U.S. government Air Force recovers downed saucer. Okay, so this is 1947. And what they did after people started panicking and so forth, kind of like H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds when Orson Welles did that whole trick on the United States or Britain. I'm not sure where he was doing that, probably around the world, but um, saying that we were being invaded and people believed it because he didn't preface the radio show with this isn't news. He ran it like it was actual news. <laughs> um, you can look that up as well. There's a little bit about that on um, uh, in, in the Woody Allen movie, Radio Days, incidentally. So... What they did when they were, this thing crashed, this kid or this this guy found it, took some of his nephews down. It was Mac Brazel's farm, um, and um, that's the name of the guy. He saw the thing, and then allegedly they said they were threatened, and a couple of the different people who have witnessed this firsthand have claimed that they've been threatened by the government by quote unquote men in black and so forth. Never talk about it. Bob says that they threatened his wife, all of that. Um, and, uh, but in my, my reading it, um, after they released the, the discovery, the announcement that they had found a downed craft, they went through, including by going directly to the, the broadcast stations and at one point literally taking something off the wire when it was coming and they were about to announce it and they were forced people in the newspapers and the radios were forced to submit retractions that said it was really a weather balloon there are witnesses to that as well so there's a famous picture of one of the one of the uh, officers holding up a piece it looks like a piece of aluminum foil and it has some strings on it and he says this is what was actually found but that doesn't look real either. And you can kind of tell a little bit by the look on his face that he might be thinking the same thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's hard to pass judgment uh, based upon a facial uh, demeanor, as we know. But um, yeah, it's an issue. It's like 
the government retracted. They, they, they forcibly went into, according to, and this was printed information by people in the military, upper level echelon people um, who were and are respected military people who said that they had printed or been forced to print a retraction. Whether or not a, a saucer actually crashed, I couldn't, I mean, I, I couldn't say, but it could have been a top secret weather balloon. And so they, they released all these staged photos with just a few pieces of aluminum where top secret weather balloons are enormous and, and somewhat frightening to encounter. I don't know, um, but the lore goes that it was a saucer. People swear up and down that it's a saucer. Mac Brazel said that he held in his hand when he picked up the pieces of the, of the saucer, quote unquote, that the metal um, would bend. You could, you, could, you could crush it up like this in your hand and then open it and it would unfold perfectly. You couldn't, you couldn't burn it, you couldn't torch it, you couldn't alter it in any way. And it wouldn't take show signs of stress. It was just perfect, pliable metal. Um, and, um, you know, that's something something to think about. Uh, um, and then there were also pieces of, they looked like hieroglyphics, they weren't sure, but on, on some of the accountings, the Brazels said that, yeah, there were pieces of, of, of structure that they had brought back home with them that were eventually, I think that they were confiscated by the military um, that had some sort of writing or encryption on it as well. So that that's that. But but those those remnants, I think that they were taken to Fort Worth first, and then they were the 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 wreckage. I, um, it went through like I think Dallas Fort Worth before actually ending up in. Um, so it went to Texas before actually ending up parked in Nevada. That's what I understand. Um, so, right, so I, I read, I, I understand the, the, that information and I've taken a look at it for quite a long time. Travis Walton was abducted in November 1975 while logging with a, a crew in Arizona, Snowflake, Arizona. And um, that's a famous uh, case. There, there are famous cases. Some cases, sure, there are thousands of people worldwide who say that they've been abducted um, for different reasons. I think that some people tell stories, some people tell the truth, and some people probably are existing in some sort of liminal reality, and I think you have to respect that as well, um, and you have to hear people out. But there are famous cases, and then there are sort of everyday cases, um, and the famous cases include Travis Walton, I would say the Betty Ann and Jason case. Her last name is also Luca. She One is a maiden name. Um, and then there's a couple, Betty and Barney Hill, were abducted. I actually studied them because their transcripts were so interesting. Um, they were from New Hampshire. They had gone to Canada and they are uh, returning. They woke up the next day in their home and realized that their clocks had stopped, their watches had stopped, and that they couldn't remember the ride home. And it was only until, or two hours from the ride home, and they had the same story. They independently told the same story in two different sessions, memory recovery sessions. I think that's the story because I think the allegation was that their memories had been altered as part of the abduction process where they came in, separated them. She said, B Betty Hill said that they didn't look like little green men. They looked like tall aliens. She said they didn't look like they were from around here but she has no understanding of little green men when people talk about reptoid aliens. Those aren't her aliens. She says that clearly in her deposition, if you will. Um, and um, so that's interesting. They were, they were uh, the size of men. And she said they, were, they did physicals on both of them separately. This is what they, they, she said, in two separate rooms. And then they came in, they took her husband in one room, and then she had to go in another room and they whatever it was that they did, um, in recounting it, fortunately for her, I don't think she has either the memory of all of the traumatic details or the actual examination was not traumatic for her. Um, you'd have to look at the transcripts probably to understand that, and she would have to explain it to, her, to you personally to really know. But um, 
she said they came in, her husband was in one room, she was in another room, and then at one point she came, they came in, and they grabbed her teeth, he made her open her mouth to look at her teeth, because her husband had dentures, and his teeth came out, and they had no idea what that was all about. Um, so that's interesting. Betty Ann Luca was abducted right up through the room of her trailer, right, right up through the, the ceiling of her trailer in etheric form. So when they would take her, they would take her spirit out of her body. The, the body left here, but the thing would come, hover, and she'd go vroom, right up into the thing. And then her story, she would recount her, her stories. Um, some of the people had sort of interactions, I think, in finer bodies somehow with these alien entities and, and so on. But Travis Walton's story is quite traumatizing. And you can hear, you can hear the, um, you can hear it uh, about it online or watch Fire in the Sky or read The Walton Experience to know more about that. But he was missing for three days. I think they started opening kind of a, a preliminary murder investigation or missing persons investigation because they, the police knew something was wrong when they went to Snowflake and said, our friend is gone, our friend is gone. And they weren't sure why they would have faked something like that because eventually the men said it was something, it was a flying saucer that took them. The chief of police didn't buy it up front, and eventually Travis Walton was found. I think it was, you know, it was 80 to 100 miles away, or it was a long distance off. And he had been gone for three days, and he showed up, I think, entirely naked and, and basically petrified. Um, but that was his recounting. They never could figure out why a group of men would fake a story like that to get out of a logging contract. It seems really um, untenable to propose that. So, um, right, Nevada, interesting place, S4, interesting place. There's a, there's a restaurant called The Little Alien, which is supposedly the most famous restaurant in Nevada, The Little Alien, which must have been started sometime in the 60s, I imagine. Um, and um, it's called the Extraterrestrial Highway at one point, too, now, down in Nevada because of all the stories and all the lore. Everybody associates those, that big open expansive, amazing desert road that can also be very dangerous to traverse. Um, uh, they've renamed it the Extraterrestrial Highway. So, yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, I, I'd say I have references to the people who wrote th that book making that disclosure about the government coming in. And there's a whole section, too, at the Pentagon, which I'm not disclosing anything classified. They just they declassified they declassified information a while back, releasing. Um, Carter had collected documentation. Project Blue Book had been an effort to chronicle as many um, citizen reported and police reported military um, accounts and witnessing as possible. They ended up closing that eventually, but there have been several projects. Grudge was one. These are in the intelligence community. They're known as Grudge. One's called Twinkle. That's That one is quite esoteric. Few people know about it, but it's it was a project for a while. Grudge, Twinkle, Sign. There are a bunch, and then Project Blue Book was one as well. Um, so, yeah, um, interesting stuff. Um, I think that you want to maintain context and you want to take, you know, um, you want to proceed cautiously when it comes to who's responsible for what and all of that and what the loss actually is. It takes great discernment to handle that information responsibly. Let's put it that way. Great discernment. But I had an experience too. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not one of these people who thinks that he's been followed repeatedly um, for years. I know people who, of people who have had several abductions and so forth. And Travis, I don't think Travis was ever retaken, but I think he's seen craft since then. And I'm not sure if he's one of the people who says that he's always followed. I don't know. Um, and I'll give him the you know, the courtesy of telling his own story, although I think that I'm a reliable chronicler of his story. My, uh, excuse me.
Hello? Okay. Sorry. Someone else's problem, apparently, because they didn't ask for me by name. Let's just make sure I'm still on the screen here. You're going to get a little dim shot of me. Okay, well, so my story. I'll just, I don't want to tell you all of my story because I think some of my story is probably just left best to the unfoldment of time. And I don't know that it's time for me to embark on all of it. But yeah, I, I've seen, I've seen ships from out of the, out of this world and don't mind talking about it. I don't want it to be a deathbed confession. I think that people should understand it for what it is or what it purports to be. Memory is odd and human experience is strange and it's difficult to know what's going on. But yeah, I was in Canada, Prince Edward Island. Um, when I was a kid, let me think for a minute, what, how old it would have been. Yeah, I'll tell you guys a story right now. Um, I was probably 12 or 13 years old, and I was um, with my family on a campground on the water, on the ocean. Canada, Considered Island has, um, it's popular because its oceans are warm. The Gulf, the Gulf Stream brings warm water up to the um, swimmable areas. So when you're swimming in Prince Edward Island water, it's actually warmer than the water that you'd swim in in Maine. Um, so one of the problems is that because it's sort of semi-tropical water, they also have like an abundance of jellyfish that sting. <laughs> so you want to be a little bit careful because there are tides um, where the, the jellyfish will come in and out. And if you're surfing, if you're body surfing or whatever coming in, you've got to be super careful. Um, and, um, right, one night I was sleeping in a truck because it had been raining in the tents and the tents get wet and it either, I think we had been rained out on the one night that I was sleeping in the truck. And, uh, so we, the truck, we had our camping gear in. So, uh, everybody else was sleeping in another tent. I was on, in a truck asleep on the beach, considered island. Cavendish Beach. Wait, at the time it was called Penderosa Beach, but the, that family sold it. And um, but the beach itself was—I think it's part of what is known as Cavendish Beach that goes on for a number of miles. And we had seen black helicopters there. Like that was a somewhat common occurrence to go outside and see black helicopters. In the air, like the government was checking up on everybody, <laughs> and um, I never thought about it except I knew in the back of my head black helicopters from having watched Project Blue Book from my family's association, which was basically a, an underground military association in Maine. Nobody really talked about it, but everybody there was involved in veterans affairs to one degree or another. I don't happen to think that those departments were upstanding at the time. I don't blame all of the families involved in that association, but it was basically a military outfit for mm, sort of the quasi-military elite in Maine. In any event, I used to watch Project Blue Book <laughs> from the television in one of those one of those cottages in Maine. So I knew about black helicopters. So when I went up to Canada when I was younger and when I checked it out, I, I, I sleep, you know, as I would go running on the beach get my snack in the morning and then go running on the beach. Well, um, yeah, black helicopters all over the place up there. So one night, so I got rained out and, and all of this, and I, I was awoken by, awakened by um, a um, no sound, just woke up. And as a matter of fact, what had happened at, at some point was I had been awake, and then I started falling asleep really quickly, but it was like a... I don't think I woke up to see it. I either woke up to see it or it actually put me to sleep before it either saw me or got me. Like, they don't really know if they got me. But um, it, I saw it. And it was either, let me think for a minute how to describe it. 
there in the truck and then sort of hanging out, I believe. I think I had, I had um, awakened at some point in the night and then I, I had dozed off and, and then it was like I was being put to sleep again and I could hear what I thought was a little dog coming down the dunes. And I thought as I fell asleep, as I was quote unquote being put to sleep, I I thought, what is a little dog doing coming down the dunes? And that's all I that's all I remembered. But, but while that was going on, I could see the thing come down behind the dunes. And what it was, it to me, I think it was either it's possible that it was the aurora. I was I was talking to people about the aurora and so forth, which is a top secret craft. Recently, it the classification level changed on that project. But there've been a number of top secret military craft that you're not supposed to talk about that, <laughs> that are that hang out down at, at Area 51 and God knows where else in, in America and Canada. Some people think um, that some of those are are retrofitted extraterrestrial designs so they include pieces of alien technology or alien technology that or they're based on alien technology that was once in the possession of the US government. Some people think that. I don't know that mine was extraterrestrial necessarily, but but um, it was entirely clo it was cloakable, which we don't really have that technology. We don't discuss it, right? Um, if you see sometimes on Star Trek, they'll do cloaking on Star Trek, and Star Trek when you go and you fight in your spaceship and so forth, you have shielding, so shields up when you're getting beaten by the Klingons. But there's also something called cloaking, and a cloaking device is when a, a, a spacecraft can be in the air or whatever is in the air or on the water and not be seen, not be seen. And we don't really possess that technology in this realm on the planet, unless it's extraterrestrial. So this thing that I saw cloak, could cloak, which is why I've always just thought that it's an extraterrestrial craft. But as I stated, it could be um, a hybrid craft, but it could cloak. And it was a, the shape of a triangle with rounded edges and I've seen the exact one on Top Secret UFO Files. There's a show called Top Secret UFO Files that actually contains Top Secret UFO Files. So some, sometimes I was trying to tell this to people the other day. People were giving me a hard time. Um, you, <laughs> yeah, some of the, you, you can get compilations online of what people are sending in. There are hundreds of them. I, I saw a UFO, so I, I shot it, you know, I shot a UFO and here it is. And you can tell that's a fake. Or some of them you're like, hmm, like a, that really, I don't really know what that is. It doesn't look like a bird. It doesn't look like a plane, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's some good fakes out there in the world or, or there are trends at trying to expose certain kind of phenomena as UFOs like swamp gas, which is interesting to look at. And if you looked at swamp gas, you wouldn't really know what it is. Like willow will-o'-the-wisps over the bogs and 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 Ireland and England at night there are there are rolling balls of fire which look like UFOs but mine was not a rolling ball of fire mine was not an ordinary um, uh, aircraft at all it was a cloaked aircraft um, and it was triangular shaped. they had rounded edges um, and um, I'll say this because I think it's the truth and I you know um, I I have people telling me to shut up about other things, and of course I can't always keep my mouth <laughs> shut. But they have a they have a um, they labeled it using my name after they read about it, and um, they never told me about it. The government didn't tell me about it, but in the in the annals, it's called a TR3B, and it's an encryption of my last name and the first name of the first letter of my birth name, TR Turner three. I'm not sure what the three means. B, so Ben Turner, and um, it's that, whatever that was, and it was either the, like an Aurora or extraterrestrial, I don't know, and I don't really know if I was taken or not, because I have never been given access to that, but I have some memories that I can't explain of being on military craft, um, and um, some of them, I've actually been on mili military craft in waking consciousness. And I've also been a military craft in uh, where I can't really tell if I am, if it's something that I actually survived or if it's something that I survived and was forced to forget. And I think forcing someone to forget, quote unquote, is a bit odd, unless it's an extraterrestrial power 
So I don't, I don't know. And I'm not really sure what the MO is of the aliens either. I'm not sure if they are able to do that or if they have an interest in doing it. Presumably, if they can come here from another universe, they can do whatever they want, for better or worse. So I put a bookmark on people who think it's an open door on going around talking about aliens. And I think people like Travis Walton probably do too. Although I think it's helpful to talk about the, about all forms of crises surrounding those narratives and to handle all information responsibly. So yeah, that was mine. And um, um, I, as I said, I saw the thing and it went, when it went down behind the dunes, it was like you were looking, it didn't move, it was silent. It was silent, it didn't make any noise. The only noise I heard, as I said, is that quote unquote little dog, which I don't think it was a little dog. And um, um, they, it, it was like when I was looking at it, you saw, you saw the light, you saw the triangle. You could see that, you couldn't really tell that it was solid, which is why I knew it was cloaked. It had, it was kind of filled with, I'd say like a, like, like a hot pink kind of, and, and blue patterns of radiation almost. That's all I could really see, but you could see the triangle. And when it came down, it came down in stages like it was showing you three different photographs of itself or not showing you even that it somehow went from being, they talk about saucers skipping over water. And I wonder sometimes if that's, it appears here and then here again really quickly and here again, like a third time in the ad infinitum or it flies off at supersonic speed, wherever the situation is. But I think that they might blink in and out of reality as part of the way that they move anti-gravitationally. So yeah, it went, it was, I could see it and it went here. You couldn't see it again for a second then it appeared again here for another second and then it appeared again here for another second. And then it was down on the dunes, supposedly I couldn't see over the dunes. And then I had a moment where I heard the dog. And when I mentioned the dog, as I was quote unquote put to sleep, and why I mentioned the dog was that a lot of people who have narratives in which they describe being abducted by flying saucers, this is something that was discussed by Whitley Strieber in the book called Communion. He endured several abductions. Um, will remember because their minds can't really deal with the fact that they've been encountered extraterrestrial life. Will remember an there's a term for it psychologically too. It's like a replacement animal or some sort of totem animal. And your mind thinks, all you can remember from last night when you were abducted, you wake up and you feel strange or you're bleeding from some orifice or you have a scoop biopsy on your arm or whatever the situation is. Someone has punctured you some, somehow with a test. You will remember not the alien, but like seeing an owl and then losing time. Or seeing a one one of the one of the people saw a wolf and then lost and then lost time and then and through memory enhancement, which is a contestable um, practice to be certain, I will then remember that it was that instead. Your mind your mind tells you that it's something else. So I wonder um, if. I think that that dog, it's called a screen memory, and I think that that's what that dog was. It was a screen memory of them coming down the dunes or my, my, they're in, implanting that in my brain so that I could just cope with the reality that that was happening. Um, but, and that was it. And then, and then um, I, that was it. That was the end of the story. But I have a memory of being on a craft. I was actually on the John F. Kennedy um at one point, all over the John F. Kennedy, which is which is military craft um, when I was younger. And I wonder sometimes if maybe it, there's a connection there. You know, I was taken on, my, my, my father was a plank holder. He was on the, ver which means that he was on the Virgin tour when it was first commissioned. During Vietnam, my father said that he was told that half the people in this filing cabinet are going off to Vietnam, which basically means that you're at risk of being killed and half the people in this filing cabinet are going to the uh, Mediterranean. At the time, the Mediterranean, the JFK, was commissioned to guard Israel from being bombed because everybody in the world was at, at risk of being bombed. The United States was worried about Israel, which is why they sent the JFK to the Mediterranean at that time. That was during Vietnam. That was 
my father's ship. I went on that ship when I was 12 years old. Um, when it was st it came up to visit Maine, and I also we visited the port in Virginia when I was much younger too, which is I think it's Norfolk, Virginia, where the thing is parked. It's about it's a huge shipyard. Um, but I actually went on the thing and went all, <laughs> all over the ship, all over the ship. Uh, not and it wasn't the way I have, I have to tell you folks it wasn't the standard tour that is given to the people who are on the uh, the receiving deck. Yeah, you can see you can be on the flight deck, at, you know, because they're not they're in harp they're in port and they're not they're not receiving aircraft. So most of the people who went on that tour were outside the flight deck. But I went to all places in the boat that some places I probably shouldn't even be telling you about. Um, but that's 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 the reality of the situation. Um, and, um, because, uh, I, it was a military tour. It was, it was a tour that was sponsored by an, a connection my father had, um, who was actually enrolled in the military. He was actually, actually an officer. So I saw chart rooms, <laughs> you name it, you name it. But yeah, um, so, but I have a second memory of, that is not a very nice memory at all of being um, basically, I think, threatened or at least misunderstood in context by American military personnel. And it looked like I was on a ship and um, they showed me something that was extraterrestrial. And this is where I don't know if it's real, but it has components of actual real life and not fiction to it. I told you know what I mean. I told you about the ship. I know I was on the Kennedy as a child. I, I can corroborate that, but um, well, I don't know if I can corroborate it actually. But it's an actual thing, and they probably have lists of when they traveled back then, and they would have been in Maine and would, would know. Um, but yeah, but this other the second time it was like being on the Kennedy, but it was kind of scary U.S. military, and I couldn't tell when they were talking to me how old I was or anything about who I was. Really, um, and I don't know, but the, the 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 presentation was scary to me because it's something that they had information that was extraterrestrial that they were disclosing to me, and it frightened me. Um, and um, as they were showing it to me, it's like they didn't care that I would be affected by it or fearful because I wouldn't remember it, or and nobody would believe me if I did remember it. Um, so, but they, and I don't even want to bother describing what, what the thing was it's another one of those screen memories where it won't really show me entirely what it is but it was some piece of weird bizarre machinery and um i again and when i it's funny the memory that i have if you watch the manchurian candidate and you look at representations of manipulated um thought forms and dreams how, how bizarre things are in the memory of it, it goes, the memory of it goes off a reel after a while. Like it literally, it shows me like the tape is ending on the reel. It's almost like you're watching one of those. Um, I don't know if they did them during vaudevillian times, but they used to have like a, the guy on the bike on the stage on the, on the stationary bike. And they, they do the background is actually rolling because it's a, a big roll of paper with trees and roadway painted and a white fence painted on it. So as the guy is going like this or pretending to walk along it looks like he is because the the background is actually moving he's not actually moving but the background is so at the end of this memory with the u.s military officers it flips off the reel and just kind of just keeps flipping off so yeah it was something creepy <laughs> and i don't know why i'm not sure why i was there and i i don't also don't know if that thing took me there either i can't i i don't know you know i'm not and i'm not sure but yeah that's what i saw and i've seen it again but it took me it took me 25 years to find the thing on on the in the reports that i accessed because often it looks like just someone shot an actual saucer in the sky okay you know that's not real or someone like shot a hubcap but i've seen very disturbing what i believe to be actual footage or potentially actual footage of craft and some of that is embedded in some of these top UFO, and I can tell I've been watching them for so long that I can tell which ones are military issued and which ones aren't, which I know is strange, but it's true. And yeah, the TR-3B, I've seen representations of that, and that's the one. So that's my that's my story. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, for what it's worth. And I'm also willing to uh, I'm also willing to entertain the notion that somehow it's just something that was implanted in my head, but I don't know why I would have been approached or targeted for that sort of information unless it's something that was intended to be used. And that's how that's where I end it. And I, I certainly would never disclose this to anybody to frighten them, only out of interest and only to the extent that we can help each other navigate sort of the strangeness of the world. But there are all sorts of strange things happening in the world that ought to be checked out by the U.S. government. For instance, this whole thing with this post they found, an uh, uh, otherworldly metal post they found out in the middle of the desert. In the middle of the desert. It's not even by a town. You'd have to go so far out of your way. You have to drive, I think it's even hundreds of miles out of your way to get to this, this place. So it's not exactly a, a tourist destination because you can't get to the place. But they actually found, through aerial reconnaissance, a post. And it's this thing like 2001 A Space Odyssey at the beginning when the monolith is there and all the Neanderthals are dancing and being acting nuts because there's something otherworldly there that is really the dawn, I think, of civilization or, or technology, rather. And they don't understand what it is because this is this imposing monolith that is in the ground. And it looks like that. It doesn't look like that, actually, but it's the same principle. It's out in the middle of nowhere um, by a bunch of cliffs. They look like sandstone cliffs. And it's just this metal post that's 12 feet tall, entirely shiny, looks like steel. I don't know what it's made out of. Some sort of alloy. And I couldn't, I have, I have yet to um, unearth, but it's there. And I have photographs of people going out to check it out, too. Um, so the military was sent out there already. When I get funding, if I ever get money and we're going to go around with my friends, Mill and otherwise, <laughs> um, you know, whatever friends, military, non-military, mystical, whatever the situation is, yeah, um, that's one of the places that I would check out. There are a bunch of places to check out where I think that these foreign energy might be attracted to locations and foreign capability extra by that i mean extraterrestrial capability might be inspired at certain points i've also seen um ufos over uh, convincing looking ufos uh, over um nuclear power facilities and things like that too like they're bothered by it or something i'm not really sure but yeah so um that's basically that's basically it um you know i have other i have other stories to tell and and narratives but wanted to get that out there so, but that's where it all starts really in 1947, according to my thesis. Yeah, there's a point in time, see, there's a point in time before people, where people didn't really care much about foreign craft, although you can go back into the Bible and read about um, what could be extraterrestrial reports in books like Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, and <laughs> in the Bible, Ezekiel saw two wheels are rolling as the old um, Baptist, Southern Baptist song goes, the gospel song goes, Ezekiel saw two wheels are rolling way in the middle of the air. A, and that, those are the lyrics, a wheel within a wheel rolling way in the middle of the air. And you keep saying way in the middle of the air. And, um, you know, the, the Bible, I can get you the passage in the Bible and, and scholars tend to say that it's an angelic visitation. But if you read it, why is it coming down in a wheel? It's some sort of airborne chariot. It says it directly in the book. So, right, it's in the Bible. It's all over the place. And, and I can guarantee in the ancient Vedas and so forth, um, you know, old religious lore. But also uh, in instances in Renaissance art, in very rare instances, you can see depictions of UFOs, flying saucers, and Renaissance art. So I'm talking about master's paintings from the 15th, 16th century where you can see you can see in the background i have i have two of them one is it looks like a flying saucer and it's just it's a flying saucer painted in a 16th century whatever it was oil painting and it was i think it was probably like a commissioned um painting of the the royalty or the householder being celebrated by the painting there's a ufo in the background and then there's a, there's another painting with a guy I've, sh I've shown it to you. It's in my Elizabeth Clare Prophet um, video where I do all of the montage of church information. And I say actual spacecraft depicted in, in, in Renaissance art. Yeah, the guy's sitting, it looks like he has a little, 
It's strange because um, it looks like a star, kind of a shooting star, but you can tell that thing's solid because there's an emblem on the side of it. And you can see a man inside of it sitting. And it looks like spacecraft. It doesn't look like a comet at all. It looks like spacecraft. So, um, and his head's turned around backwards very strangely too. Um, where else would I go? Basically, the ranges are really interesting, but you don't want to get into trouble with anybody out there. That's what they say, at least. Although, presumably, there's a nice way of working together to just take a look at it. And I don't want to say casual capacity, because I think nothing is casual when you're talking about weaponry. But I think it's awful to intimidate people. So there has to be an, uh, uh, um, an equilibrium. But there are interesting bases out there, and it's not only Area 51 that is involved in, with the secret airline that I told you about, which is alarming to me um, because it makes me feel that the government is doing something off of people's radar in a way that is not entirely appropriate. Um, but there are other bases, like I said, Fort Worth has received alien equipment and then the place with which I would like to work is Wright, we call it Wright Pat in the military, <laughs> Wright, Wright Patterson in Ohio, because that's that's the actual store house now. That's where it is. I'm not sure if they keep just the reports or allegedly they keep boxes. I mean, professionally done and all, <laughs> but yeah, or however you do that in a controlled environment, I have no idea. But yeah, Wright Pat, and the program is called DISCS, but it's actually, <laughs> which is funny, but that's an actual military program. It's called DISCS, D-I-S-C-S, and it means something other than flying saucers, but then Wright Pat is known to, for that, flying saucer wreckage and um, recut, whatever that the word is for that, when you are storing things under everybody's radar. It's, it's, a, it's a warehouse for that. So, that. But there are, other, there are other places out there, too. Uh, all sorts of interesting bases. Abandoned bases. Abandoned DOD projects that are very strange to behold. One is a pyramid that... Um, it looks like someone's tried to build a pyramid, but to make it look like a military weapon. It almost looks like a landing pad. It's an actual place. It's out in the desert. The DOD spent $6 billion on it. The place was open for three days, and then they closed it. They closed it, and I can get you a link to that as well. I say three days. The place was not open for longer than a week, and they had spent $6 billion on this place. And, of course, what it is, what is it? You guessed it. It's a nuclear, some sort of missile launch location. Unfortunately for me, I've seen photographs of that. Um, it's depressing. It's not active, but... Um, they either wanted it to be active or wanted to send a message that I was active. I don't believe that it's in use, but I think it's still manned. I think there must be some sort of custodial work ongoing at that location because it looks too dangerous to leave alone without protecting it or, and they have not decided to take the thing down yet. Um, yeah, and that's, I don't, I can't remember where that is, but I have photographs of that and can get that to you. But what, what strikes me about it, sure, I've seen, so, missile lo launch pads and underground, you know, weapons, all of that, to me, uh, leaves a bad taste in my mouth and it's frightening to behold. But what's odd about it is a um, pyramid that, as I said, it, it looks like, and I'm not sure, it looks like it's built out of space shuttle material. And it's, it's, it's not the size of the Pyramid of Giza. It's not a full Valley of the King's Pyramid, but it is a big pyramid with a truncated top, like when you see on the top of the dollar bill before the, the all-seeing eye is, is put, Anoet Coeptus. Well, Anoet Coeptus. It's that. But no top, like, like on the dollar bill. I can get you links to that. So, moving ahead, I'm not sure how to move ahead. Um, people have to find, a, not only do people have to find funding to research and so forth, but people have to develop traction to raise funding on their own. So I'm a little bit hamstrung, if that's the word, um, and meaning that it's hard for me to really proceed 
in any direction under these circumstances, which I hope funding somehow is pushed my way. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But, um, yeah, those are, those are important issues and interesting topics. And, you know, they need to be handled respective, respectfully as well. Let me see if I can come up with a little bit of information for you really quickly. I mean, if I could grab one thing as the next cool guy getting his stripes and who's enough of an entrepreneur and nerd <laughs> to get to hang out at these places, my, my first out would be right path because of its stature with regard to discs. Disney tickets, exactly. So what's this? Defense Institute of Security Cooperation Studies, okay? And basically, I do that now because I want to call this a DOD school, and I'm in a DOD school right now. Um, for the consolidated professional education of personnel involved in security assistance management, that's what they call it, SAM, DISCS is located at wright Pat Air Force Base. It provides an array of resident and non-resident instruction for both USG and foreign government, military, and civilian personnel, as well as for defense contractor and industry personnel. But it's Defense Institute Security Cooperation Studies, and that is at Wright Path Discs, D-I-S-C-S. -S. And this is directly from the military. This is public information. Let's see. White Sands is another location that pops into my brain all the time, like I'm being led down the Piggly Wiggly path in um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where everybody's getting the information about in their brains, like because the aliens are communicating that they're coming in advance, and so people are getting images of Devil's Tower and not knowing why they keep seeing a tower in their brain. <laughs> so the lead, the lead guy, as he's getting his messages doesn't understand it and he becomes obsessed with making sculptures of the thing trying to figure out what it is that he's looking at out of his mashed potatoes and he takes half the lawn from his uh, neighbor's yard and throws it into his garage until his wife leaves him because he's just sitting all day playing in mud and sticks trying to figure the thing out and it's only until he sees it one day happens to see it on the news that he knows that it's what it is but it's only by chance that he kind of comes across it so that's interesting too Devil's Tower is an actual place. Um, it's an actual rock phenomenon. Um, and, right, <clears throat> White Sands is the other place that's associated with extraterrestrials. There's an incident, White Sands incident, how extraterrestrial telepathy works. That's something to take a look at. It's called the White Sands Incident. <clears throat> you can buy it on Amazon. Mm, I have a picture of it. It's not a very convincing picture. Which many aren't. You kind of have to deal with the fact that many are not convincing pictures. Hmm. Yeah, you really can't tell out of context entirely. They want to say crash, too. That's correct. There's a second crash that isn't discussed with as much frequency, and it's White Sands, New Mexico. Oh, the other thing, there have been a couple celebrities who have seen... seen um, there have been celebrities that have reported seeing craft, and I'll tell you a Jackie Gleason story, too. Um, Jimmy Carter saw one, and it's... Reported and it's in it's in the public. It's in the public system that he saw a UFO. He openly admitted to it um, I'm trying to think of who else But one Jackie Gleason was taken by someone. I think it was during the Nixon administration He hooked up with someone uh, They had had a bunch of this guy had made this confession to him about stuff that had been going on on one of the bases I can find it for you. He, he told this story um, um, He the guy said, you have to have some scotch. We have to figure out this thing. What's going on, Bob? Whatever the guy's name was, Jackie Gleason said. 
um, and, and all this stuff about stuff that was going on at one of the bases. So Jack, he's, he's like, I can get in there. Jack and Gleason said, okay, let's go check it out. They go to check it out, um, and Jackie Gleason said he was taken into a room um, on a military base um, or in a hangar. I'm not really sure what the environment was, but you could see what he said they looked like refrigeration units on the floors. I think there were six of them. Cases. Um, uh, whatever, whatever they were. I think cases with glass lids and that there was some sort of uh, controlled environment within those cases and he thought at first that he was looking at he didn't know what he was looking at at first because he thought they were kids he said that he thought they were kids because they were small um and um and then he got closer and he could see that they weren't children and i'm not sure if i i, I don't know if he was told by his friend his associate i don't recall whether or not that was a morgue or whether or not they were in some sort of um stasis biological stasis um i i couldn't answer that question for you um but right and that's part of the lore as well that's in like the if you when you dig and, and i get excited people know about white sands like that's the it's the mini it's the mini roswell and there's one in russia too and say like they don't really talk about the crash in russia very much either roswell one tends to stand out but people don't know the details and i know about the tape being yanked off the wire so um yeah, that's there and um, to, 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 to read and think about as well. But yeah, it can be a frightening world or a not frightening world. My experience has been that most of what's frightening about the world doesn't come from outer space. But the proposal that entities come from outer space can be frightening. And the notion that the government would manipulate people is also frightening. And something to monitor and think about because ethics have to come into play at a certain point it's required if you have a system that is too secretive that is not directed by ethics then you're in a lot of trouble because there's enough pain in the world to support all of the military being properly oriented when all of the military is properly oriented inclusive employing people the right way paying people the right way not threatening people if you want to be involved in my classified project, please keep your mouth shut to the extent that you and I agree that it's uh, appropriate to do so. Um, I would never ask you to surrender your personal freedom or privacy. I also would never disclose to you information that I didn't think it, uh, that, that is not to be redisclosed under certain circumstances because I'll just keep my mouth shut if I want to keep a secret. So secrets, not necessarily cool, big remote governmental projects that could possibly house extraterrestrial craft, um, possibly cool, but shouldn't necessarily be kept a total secret. Uh, so um, I, I don't know. And I think that you can manage information in a way in which only the light bearers are involved in the top tier information coming out of Lockheed Martin and not our enemies, not people trying to kill us, hurt us, hunt us down, all of that. But you have to have a, a functioning military where everybody is involved and where all forms of specialty are properly integrated. Mine happen to be animal and human rights. So I care about animals. I care about halfway animals too, like Nephilim from outer space, who maybe not come here because maybe you won't like it here. And that is part of my mission. In fact, like if someone, you know, possibly stay away because we can't, we would treat you badly if you came here, brought your 20 friends here um, uh, and wanted to set up shop. You'd be disappointed if you thought you were going to get a fair shake in a world in which Travis Martin still, uh, Trayvon Martin still occurs. And in a world in which the Supreme Court is the way that it is, and in a world in which we still have death row, in a world in which we're told that we're going to be blown up by the bomb, maybe the aliens shouldn't be here. Sure, there's speculation that they come here to protect people, or they come here to monitor the planet when things get to be too out of bounds. But my competing theory is that possibly things are too out of bounds for them to come here in the first place because of a horribly they would be treated if they came here and survived. And there is a, a report of surviving extraterrestrials, and I won't get into that right now. 
um, I, I worry about any tra extraterrestrial being that lived, you know, that lived in S4 for however many years he or she survived. That makes me sad to think about. So I hope that any being, whether or not you're a human being or from another realm, um, is treated properly by the military under all circumstances, which is why as part of my revamped career path, I would like to focus on ethics when it comes to how we're dealing with all of that information. So, yeah, the Russian one, I can, I can get to that to you as well. Um, I think I'm going to put, I'm going to post this just so that we can share information and start the dialogue going. <laughs> um, I appreciate your taking the time and I hope that um, you are interested in, in my work and if you are not interested in having this conversation and participating in it, there are other opportun opportunities within church. It's that I'm not really getting to the church employment quickly enough and I have to figure out who's going to pay for what and what it is that I have to do to understand this whole Groom Lake problem and also to understand the issue with Church Universal and Trampton. And there are there are ties between those two issues. Okay, this is it. Namaste and thanks for listening to my information. Again, my name is Ben, Benjamin Turner. I'm a military chaplain in between billeting. I'm in the process of being hired by the military, but there's a lot of red tape. If you are a lawyer or an individual investor or someone with a stake in maybe military bases or some of the legal actions that have been filed with which I'm associated, um, definitely come forward. We can figure out a way to push everything forward because there's a lot of entropy in the military and it's not really unfolding very quickly. But we pray together and we try to maintain similar um, forms of relating and we retrench our information um, so that we can be on the same page um, one other thing, when I was involved briefly in a project, I talked to a man who had um, been thrown off one of the military boards uh, by the U.S. Air Force at some juncture, and he said that they, when they did the reporting, he and other people had gone in because there were ethical problems with how the military was handling their aircraft registration system. And what I discovered was that they, this group of people with whom I'm affiliated interfered when they had heard, when they were heard, heard reports of, they called it anti-gravity spacecraft. Um, and uh, a friend of mine who's in the military asked me, where would we start in, not an expose, but a private investigation that would lead to your employment at Wright Pat or through whatever component of the military is now dealing with this whole topic. I said that, that that's a great place to start because we don't have, there, there's no such thing as anti-gravity aircraft. If you have anti-gravity -air aircraft, reports of it in, in an unauthorized area, you're breaking all sorts of laws. You're breaking US military law or, or, or that craft is breaking US military law and it has to be reported in any event. But the actual, the actual that preliminary stage of the investigation <laughs> was initiated because someone had reported within the military the presence of, on this particular forbidden air zone, in, in that air zone, forbidden air zone, the presence of uh, anti-gravity. And I think it said, I don't think it said spacecraft. I think it said anti-gravity aircraft, which don't exist. They're spacecraft if they're anti-gravity aircraft because we don't have that sort of technology. Anti-gravity is when you can just move at whatever speed you want, like, an, like when you see a flying saucer, it moves vertically, it moves diagonally. No plane or helicopter in existence does that. They don't move that way. Anti-gravity anti is, and also the, the propulsion system is entirely different. We're, at that point, we're getting into dealing with Bob Lazar and my, my other guy. Let me tell you who, his name really quickly because he's super interesting. Um, I, I so apologize because this is my milieu and
you can get top 10 most famous UFO witnesses. What are they going to say? They won't list who it is in advance. Bob Lazar is basically at the top of most of them. What are they going to do? Take him down so I can't see? I know because he's the guy who saw the engine. Um, it's just the name I don't have. Um, I, I can see it. No, it's not Bob Lazar, though. It's the other guy. Okay, death, but I don't want death in my, in my locker. I want life, but intriguing components of it. Okay, Lockheed Martin here is saying that there really are aliens in this one interview. Right, and then they're talking about a veteran who is a... This guy is actually researching anti-gravity in quotes. And he's an Area 51 veteran and CIA electronic warfare pioneer. Okay, and that's on thedrive.com. Is that what it's called? Forward slash the war zone. I think, yeah, it's called The Drive, and it's called The War Zone, and you just do a search, uh, the title is Area 51 Veteran and CIA Electronic Warfare Pioneer Way In on Navy UFO Encounters. There are pictures of it. The writer is Tim McMillan. You'll have to figure it out. You'll have to find it. And we're calling them UA apps now and not UFOs. That's true. Someone was laughing about me today. They're called U apps now. The military, we, that's what we call them in the Air Force. <laughs> Unidentified aerial phenomena. It changed from UFO. We, we discontinued using that. So now it's U app. And Okay, high range tracking. I think his last name is Barnes. And actually, right, Project o Oxcart, there's spy planes too. You know, when they want to keep people out of places, they say, well, you can't because it's, it's foreign and all that. It's lucky. One, one argument, perfectly viable, unless you don't want to discount the stories of Bob Lazar and. I think it's important not to call people liars, you know what I mean? But one conceivable reality is that it's mostly spycraft. And, and, and my addition to that, when they take people out into Area 51 by way of secret flights and a secret airline and all of that, and they go out, military people and engineers and stuff secretly go out that they're really working on top secret military governmental projects. My addition to that is an interest in understanding and where UFO technology might be included, but at what stage during the engineering process? And at what point, like if you look at the, at the you know, not necessarily the Aurora, but I think the Blackhawks, like beginning with the Blackhawks and so forth, there's one called the A-17 um, that, that some people think, and the stealth bomber even, some people think, and I think that it might be the case that the stealth has, has retrofitted parts. If you look at the thing, it doesn't look like it is really from around here. And I think some of that design is probably foreign in origin. And I think that about some of the naval vessels too, as well. And nobody really talks about that yet, but it's, it's a thing. They do talk about whether or not extraterrestrials are involved because there, there are people who fully believe that that's, that's going on. And pe people I know who have witnessed what goes on in these, in these places. Um, uh, so it's interesting to think about what is of this earth and what is not of this earth when it comes to human design. Well, Oxcart, by the early 60s, this gentleman pictured in this presentation um, would be whisked away by the Central Intelligence Agency to work on Project Oxcart, okay? The development of the A-12 spy plane is Project Oxcart at the ultra reclusive and then quite new area 51 so area 51 was new in the 60s 
Yeah, and it's the Blackbird, like the SR-71 was the A-12's successor. It's the Blackbird, and that one is also likely of extraterrestrial origin. Or likely contains, let me just, let me just stir the pot, pot, likely contains extraterrestrial parts. Which, in line with what Bob Lazar already says openly, I'm getting you a link to this right now. When I click, if, if a document could open without trying to brain me to death, that would be amazing. Okay, and then... Every last one in the VA, huh? Okay, let's pin it, please. And I'm just going to call it Electronic Warfare. And put it right on my desk. Uh, like that, and I'll, put, I'll post the links um, beneath. Um, any other information that we, I'm trying to think of what else you might need to know. Um, not sure. Um, other stories, there, there are, yeah, those are my top recs. If you want me to give you a, a summary of the recs, where I would start, I would start with those cases that I mentioned. But the reality is, that's really just for, you know, casual, your, your side interest, it's important to develop those parts of the mind, and it is of interest because it affects all of us, including, you know, the fact that there are thousands of documents held by the government in, in the archives that are um, reports from Majestic 12. Majestic 12 is, is, a, is a collection of people, the 12 people appointed, all men, appointed to know more and study more about about UFOs. And there have been like odd deaths. One of the guys died a very strange death, and I believe it was Forrestal. But I'll talk about that on another occasion. I'd rather leave on an up note. Um, yeah, in order to get, if people are actually serious about wanting to do consulting or if people are actually serious about trying to retrench with me to get out there, yeah, you'd want to go out, let me think for a minute, you'd want to go out, I mean, the most practical thing to do is to resolve my billeting problem because I can't do anything if I'm not properly billeted by the military and if I don't have my driver's license. So that's where, those are the places where I would start if people were serious about wanting to do this for reconnaissance purposes. Also, the Pentagon mandated that this be funded. And that's not something that I'm making up. I can find, you know, sources for you on the internet that say that there's all this funding for reconnaissance programs, including the study of UAPs. And it says that specifically in there. There's money for UAPs to deal with those um, phenomena. All right, I'll talk to you later. Take care. God bless. And um, be in touch with me if you're interested in this topic. I appreciate it. Find me on social media. My name is Benjamin Turner. Uh, military chaplain and UAP witness. Thanks a lot for listening to my information. Peace.